We come to a time of uh, prayer, and I'd like to invite you to pray with me for our church and our upcoming retreat and our offering. So if you will, just bow your heads with me. Father God, we thank you for Sunday and bringing us here that we can worship you together as one church. Lord, we ask that you will uh, bless our upcoming retreat and that you will Bring us closer together as your people as we seek to find ways to uh, revitalize our church. But Lord, we know that in the end it's all about you and we need you to revitalize your church. So Lord, let us come before you humbly and to ask, please Lord, use us. Use us to accomplish your will in this part of our town. And let us glorify you in all that we do. And for our offerings, Lord, we give them back to you so that you will use us, use our church to do ministry across this land that we will be honoring you and worshiping you with every aspect of our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you ever feel like you've been waiting on God for a long time? Maybe you were given a sense that God promised you something, but it has not yet come. Perhaps you've been praying for God to work in someone dear's life, but it's been years, decades, and that person still doesn't know God. It's difficult to hold on to our faith in God when we don't see immediate results. Returning to the Old Testament book of Joshua, we look again at the purpose of this text. And we have to remember that history keeping for ancient writers was not so much about simply recording the events themselves, but rather to document the effects of what the gods were doing. So the Bible is a document of the effects of what the God was doing, the one true God. Joshua and the Israelites had by and large conquered the promised land up to chapter 12. But in Joshua 13, verse 1, it tells us that there are still, uh, there remains yet very much land to possess. There was still land to possess. It was not completely done yet. But the Lord continues that while this may be the case, and, th and that he will drive out the people, God commands Joshua at this point to go ahead and allot the land of Israel for an inheritance. So it is that the Lord gave each tribe their land allotments even before being completely cleared out. If it were anyone else, we might think of them as optimistic or even prophetic. But with God, it is a guarantee of a promise that will be fulfilled. This is the kind of God that the one true God is He makes promises that he absolutely keeps because he does not lie nor deceive. He also allows humans, his creatures, to participate in what he's doing. The Lord God was using the Israelites to clear out the land of Canaan to establish Israel. Exactly how each parcel of land was divided was also uh, determined by Moses and Joshua rather than God saying exactly this is the line. The humans had a part to play in figuring that out. This shows that God allows humans to take a part in making decisions. But we also see that Joshua did as he was told by God. Everything was starting to come into view, but it was still coming in God's timing. Speaking of God's timing, it'd be a good time to mute your phones. 
Yeah. If somebody wants to call in, you just quietly slide yes, and you let them listen in to the sermon. Okay? Just. But the rest of us don't need to know that the conversation started. Faith is to trust in God in all circumstances. The Lord is faithful to those who trust in him. Let's turn to Joshua chapter 14 as we see what is going on in the story of Israel. Joshua chapter 14 starts with this. These are the inheritances that the people of Israel received in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel gave them to inherit. Their inheritance was by lot, just as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine and a one-half tribes. For Moses had given an inheritance to the two and one-half tribes beyond the Jordan, but to the Levites he gave no inheritance among them. For the people of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. And no portion was given to the Levites in the land, but only cities to dwell in, with their pasture lands for their livestock and their substance. The people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses and allotted the land. Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, in Kadesh Barnea concerning you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your, your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said, these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now, behold, I am this day 85 years old. I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is uh, my strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country for which the Lord spoke on that day, for you you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Then Joshua blessed him, and gave, he gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. Therefore, Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, the name of, the Hebron, the name of Hebron formerly was Kiriath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim, and the land had rest from war. Again, faith is to trust in God in all circumstances. The Lord is faithful to those who trust in him. We get to go through an interesting story today, and it's the story of Caleb and his faith. A lot of kids are named Caleb, and we don't seem to go back to the story too much and think too much about what all did Caleb do? Today, we shall see. Caleb had a particular memory. He remembered God's promise. He was one of two spies, the other being Joshua himself, who trusted in God's promise. He comes before Joshua in this chapter and recounts his personal history in regards to his inheritance this thing that he's been waiting on. In Numbers 13, not Joshua 13, Numbers 13, we find this story in the records, the annals of the people of Israel. Moses sent Caleb from Judah and Joshua from Ephraim, along with ten, others, ten other spies, one from each tribe, to spy out the land of Canaan. They were sent to see if the land was good, 
What was the produce like? In fact, bring some produce back if possible. See if it's indeed the land of milk and honey. Also, go check out what the people are like. Check out the cities, or if they are in just tents, or if they're in, what, what, what's the situation? How are they living there? What are the fortifications like? What are the people like? Because we know when we get there, we're going to have to fight them. And so these spies, the 12, they covered the land from the very south to the very north. Of note was the mention of Hebron. In Numbers 13, it's even noted that it was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. While the ten other spies had noted that the land was indeed good, the cities, they said, were indeed fortified. They also noted that the Canaanites were strong. How did Caleb respond? His simple response was this. Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. What an attitude that he had. The ten other spies thought otherwise and discouraged the Israelites by talking about the Nephilim, the, San, the sons of Anak, being there. They used these words, Nephilim, the sons of Anak. This caused the people of Israel to grumble against Moses and Aaron. We see this in Numbers 14. And they even suggested choosing a leader to lead them back to Egypt. Let's go back to slavery. That would be better. What kind of mindset was this? The rejection of God and his leadership was on full display. Caleb and Joshua, along with Moses and Aaron, were before the people pleading and assuring them, saying, the Lord will bring us into this land and give it to us. Have no fear. But the people threatened to stone them. And God threatened to disown them. But in his judgment against that generation, God saved Joshua and Caleb. None of that generation that witnessed God's glory and the signs in Egypt in the wilderness, none of them, according to God's judgment, would see the land that God swore to give to their fathers. But in Numbers 14, verse 24, it says, But my servant Caleb... Because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Why? Because they held on to God's promises. Joshua and Caleb were two of their generation that were allowed to even go into the promised land. Moses himself would fail. Aaron fell already. They already knew that the land of Canaan was given to Abraham's descendants. They were witnesses to God's hand in delivering them from Pharaoh in Egypt. They walked across the dry ground of the Red Sea. And they had followed God fully in every circumstance. These two spies, Joshua and Caleb, had it very clearly understood. We know who we're with. We know who we're fighting for. This is not a false god of Egypt. This is not a false god of Canaan. This is the one true God. We've seen his power. We trust him to provide for everything. And that his promises are good. And if he promised our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that we're going to get this land, then we're going to get this land. Let's go up there and get it. Why not? Why not was their mentality. These people, the rest of these Israelites, they were afraid. They were led to be afraid by these ten other spies who had less faith, who did not trust God, even though they had seen the same things. 
they use the word Nephilim, which was, we've seen uh, only if we go back to the account of Noah's Ark. And it's a mysterious word, and there's still lots of debate about who on earth they were. But they were supposed to have been people of renown. They were supposed to be more or less probably giants. What they're, where they come from and all that stuff has been of some debate, but the fact of the matter is these ten spies came back to Israel and said, hey, look, those guys are there. And it freaked everybody out. It freaked everybody out, but two. Faith is to trust in God in all circumstances. The Lord is faithful to those who trust in him. They did not have faith. And if you do not have faith to trust in God, why should God work with you? Caleb learned to stand firm in faith. Caleb had a very strong confidence in God's power. Caleb had every reason to trust in God. Since the time he spied out Canaan, 45 years had now passed to get to Joshua chapter 14. 45 years. Some of you can remember 45 years ago. Think back. It's now 2024. Where would, we, where would that put us? Seventy-nine? Okay, not everybody in this room can remember 19, 19, 1979. But some of you can. And you can probably figure out, you know, it, it's late April, 1979. Where were you? You may not remember the exact day, but you remember kind of what happened that year maybe? You have some markers in your, 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 your memory. That's how far back Caleb was thinking. And since he had been a part of God's campaign in conquering the promised land since then, more recent memories told him other things. So he remembered all the way back and said, okay, that was a while ago, and we saw Pharaoh. I remember being enslaved. Yep, mm -hmm. that part was crummy. I was 40 years old, and my back had, you know, probably a few cuts and lashes and whatnot. Um, I remember the 10 plagues, yes, but they're distant memories now, a little bit distant, yeah? But I... Come on, if you had gone through the ten plagues, would you remember? Those are some pretty serious things, right? Remember the Passover with the lamb and everything? That was something that they would commemorate every year. Then after that, you get to the Red Sea, and you're panicking because there's the sea in front of you, and there's Pharaoh's army behind you, and God dries up the seabed, so that you can walk across dry ground. It does not say muddy ground. It does not say slop. It does not say swamp. It's not Louisiana. It's dry ground. And you crossed over, and then the sea came in after it and wiped out Pharaoh's army. These are the things I remember far back there. And since then, what have I seen? Caleb has seen the crossing of the Jordan at Gilgal. And how Jericho was conquered by God's hand when they, all they did was walk around it a bunch of times. They didn't even lift a finger. They just walked. These are much more recent memories. About five years ago. Because they had spent time in the wilderness for 40 years. And then they entered into the promised land and had been conquering and now that he's talking about the number of years, it's, been, it's at 45. It's been five years since those things happened. Five years is a lot easier to remember. 
and it confirms what he saw 45 years ago. He saw the subsequent conquests from king to king to king as they went around conquering city to city. Caleb had seen it all. And I imagine as the, other, uh, as the only other person over 45 as Joshua, uh, Caleb understood God's power. Do you understand there was this weird dynamic in this community where everybody was younger than 40? Or 45, since there's five, five more years here. Everybody was younger than 45, otherwise they died in the wilderness. Except two guys. A little bit of a weird dynamic. You're either 85 or you're under 45. My question to you, though, is what have you witnessed in your life of God's power? What have you heard? Either search far back or something more recent. What have you witnessed or heard about God's power? Has God ever answered your prayers? Not every prayer. Has he ever answered any of your prayers? Has God shown love and mercy beyond reason? Has he dealt justice when no one else could? Have you heard of miraculous signs and healing? Do you, cru- do you trust that God is powerful and able? So just as Caleb had trusted in God's power those 45 years ago to overcome Canaan, Caleb now demonstrated his faith in God at 85 to go into the hill country and take the land. He stood firm over this 45-year span. 45 years ago, he told Joshua, remember, we went there. We spied it out. We saw it then, and I came back and I said, what? Let's go do it. It's been 45 years. Remember that piece of land over there where we got the fortified, fortified cities in the hill country inhabited, inhabited by, at this point it says Anakim, which is the Hebrew short form of the sons of Anak. Remember that group of people, the giants that everybody's afraid of, that let, kept us out there for 40 years? And now it's been another five. I'm strong today like I was back then. I'm ready for it. What I said back then goes for me today. Let's go get it. Give it to me and I'll go get it. 45 years. Same firm faith. He was firm in his belief in God's presence and that God would drive those people out. He had the same faith at 85 that he had at 40, which he had developed from the time before. How long has it been for you to wait on the Lord's timing? Have you held on and stood firm in your faith in God? Maybe it's been a while. Maybe it's been a few decades. Do you trust God? Imagine the waiting that Caleb had done. 40 years of wandering around the wilderness because his people were faithless. Not his own fault. He was ready to go. But he went with his people and waited. 40 years he waited for the people to die out as was their God-given punishment. All your friends, all your relatives that you knew of your generation, Every one of them, except Joshua, watching them die, mourning their their deaths, not going, nah, nah, I told you so, but mourning them, I'm sure. Forty years he raised his own children and others to trust in God when the time came. 
And when 40 years were done, five more were added to the time of the conquest. Five more years of getting to this point of divvying up the land for inheritance. Caleb trusted in God's promise, in God's ability, his power to fulfill his promise. And so Caleb continued to choose to follow God wherever he may go. How much more should we, with the knowledge of all of this history, and so much more, we get the benefit of all of this. We even get to see where Jesus comes. We see the testimonies of so many more of God's servants and their witnesses of God's power. Should we not stand firmly in faith to trust God no matter the circumstance that we're in? Faith is to trust in God in all circumstances. The Lord is faithful to those who trust in him. Caleb came to claim the mountain. And in claiming the mountain, he petitioned, he gave his request for God's inheritance. Caleb came to Joshua, God's chosen leader of the people at this time, to divvy up the land. And he makes the request for Hebron, located in the hill country. Notice what he says. He says, I am old. I'm 85. But I'm still as strong today as I was then. God has given me strength enough to still go today and take that land. I know there are Anakim, the sons of Anak, or giants, or strong men there. And so I'll have to fight. That's okay. I know whose side I'm on. As God has promised to give me that land, I am still willing to go and take it with God's blessing. None of his speech suggests that he plans on doing it against God's will. In fact, if we went back to Numbers 14, we'll see that the people of Israel, after being admonished by God, tried to go and take Canaan. And they were beaten back so badly that they had to come, the few that survived came crawling back to Moses in the wilderness and said, fine. Caleb said, if God's with me, then I will take it. Caleb had no doubt in the Lord. He remembered God's promises, and he was confident in God's power. So he moved forward in sure faith to receive what God wanted to give him. Now Caleb had not asked for the flatlands by the sea to retire. Some of us might choose that, right? We might have said, hey, look, if you're going to divvy out the land, and this land's got mountains, and it's got ocean, or the Mediterranean Sea, and all this stuff, you might choose the Mediterranean Sea, huh? And just chill out there in a nice little, I don't know. It's the Mediterranean. I mean, seems pretty cool, right? No. He asked for Hebron. You know that hill country with the fortified city with the giants that everybody was afraid of and it made us, that's why we've been delayed by 45 years? That place, that's where I want to go. Give me that. Now, in Numbers 13, we see that Hebron had been mentioned as being built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And we got to kind of figure out what the significance is of Hebron. The Cultural Background Study Bible explains that Hebron was located somewhere between 20 and 25 miles south of Jerusalem in the central hill country. It must have been a prominent city at this time, even in Numbers 13 meaning the 45 years prior, when Moses was still the leader and they had just approached Canaan and had not been turned back towards the wilderness yet. It must have been a prominent city because its comparison here is with the Egyptian stronghold of Zoan, which would have been a reference point that these Israelites who had just left Egypt would have known. They know what Zoan is. Hebron is said to have been fortified seven years before Zoan. 
So it's the predecessor. It, it was already fortified. Meaning it had walls. Meaning it was protected. Its people were defined. The descendants of Anak were noted for being there. They were regarded as giants. And an Egyptian letter from the 13th century BC describes warriors being of nine feet tall. That's pretty big. I mean, Shaq's not that big. Other sources noted that Hebron was in the watershed of those hills, a good place for farms because there was plenty of moisture in the ground. Biblically, Hebron was the only property that Abraham bought. Genesis chapter 23 tells us that. And that's something that we've been studying in Cardia more recently. Just put that in mind. That piece of property that he bought to bury his wife. This was the place that he was, that Abraham was buried in. So was Isaac. And so was Jacob. The patriarchs were buried in a cave bought at Hebron. This was the family land. At this point, it wasn't just a family, small family. It was the big family, the nation's land. This was the only piece of property that had been properly bought out by their own family. Hebron represented the promise of God to give the land to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And so here Jacob is, Israel, the people coming back some 400 plus years later, plus 45, saying, we're going to take it because it belongs to us and God has given it to us and it's his promise. There are many mountains that we face in life. No number of giants were going to keep Caleb from taking those mountains from Hebron. It didn't matter if they were big or small. God had given it to him, so he was going to take it. What are some mountains that you face in life? What are those obstacles that are in your way? Do you trust that God will help you conquer those obstacles? Is God leading your way? Will you follow him? If he uses circumstances to direct your way. Sometimes those obstacles are meant to move you along in a certain direction. Sometimes they're meant for you to trust in God. Does he want you to turn or does he want you to go through? It's easy to charge when and where we want but we need God's timing and direction. Faith is to trust in God in all circumstances. The Lord is faithful to those who trust in him. We're told that we need to finish strong. In fact, we're told to press toward the goal. And this idea of finishing strong that we see in Caleb was talked about by the Apostle Paul. Paul says in Philippians 3, in the New Testament, so the other end of the book, all right, if you're flipping. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You might say that Paul said to forget what lies behind, whereas Caleb remembered. But let's examine whose deeds we are to forget and whose we are to remember. Caleb did not dwell on what he did as to gloat. Caleb talks about it a little bit. But even while remembering the past, his emphasis was on what God had done. Caleb was latching onto God's promise. 
Caleb held on to the promise of God who is faithful to do what he says. Caleb pressed on toward the goal for the prize that God had promised to him. And so Caleb received the inheritance of Hebron for his family. Caleb had wanted all his life to be in that place that God had promised. And finally, he got there at 85. What is your prize? The Apostle Paul lays out that our prize is the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. While indeed an athlete's prize is received by coming up to the podium, and Paul was using this motif of running a race and having this Olympic idea of having to step up to receive your prize. Paul clearly here identifies that the believer's prize is being called up heavenward to God's presence. Is this the prize that you are striving for? Hmm? Is this what you're looking for? Or have you lost sight of our heavenly reward and begun seeking the things of this world? Have you forgotten the promise of God who gave his son to redeem you from sin? Are you so distracted by the challenges of this world, the cities, and the giants? Is your faith in this world, or is it in the Lord? Learn from Caleb, and remember how God has brought you through challenges. Remember your Egypt. Remember your Pharaoh. Remember your Red Sea. Remember your Jordan. Remember your Jericho. Remember, then stand firm in your faith and claim God as your prize. Do you want to be where God wants you? Have faith. Trust God in every circumstance. Your prize is to be with him in eternity. God has promised to give, to, to bring us into his presence as our final inheritance. Our inheritance isn't a piece of land in Palestine. Our inheritance is Jesus himself. And if we are with God, the creator, then is not everything our inheritance. Pray for faith in the Lord. Ask him to remind you of his promises. Then stand firm in faith. Believe that God is able to fulfill his will. Pray for courage to claim the mountains in life. Trust God to help you conquer difficulties. And pray to finish strong. Ask God to help you to hold tight to him that you finish the race of life. Because faith is to trust God in all circumstances. And the Lord is faithful to those who trust in him. We need to come to faith in Jesus. Oftentimes we think of this as merely the basic invitation to say, hey, do you know that you have sin? Do you admit it? Do you know that you need Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross to wash your sins away? Will you accept him as your Lord and Savior? Then you get baptized. You join the church. And then faith in Jesus is more than just that moment. It's growing in life with him all the rest of the way. 45 years, 85 years, 105 years. However 
long the Lord puts you here on this earth. Have faith in him. Trust him. Strive for that future inheritance of being with him in eternity. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for ultimately your sacrifice on the cross to bring us salvation not just in a moment, but for eternity. Lord, you promise eternal life, and you have not broken a promise from the beginning of time. So we know that the promise of eternal life is true. Lord, help us to have faith to stand firm in you, to lay claim in you. Lord, help us to live our lives, no matter what challenges may come, that we should always keep you first, that we will claim you as our own. Lord, help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Well, this would be a nice time to uh, welcome everyone to church. And if you want to turn on your phones again, I suppose you could. But um, you might want to ring somebody who needs to hear the uh, doxology coming up because we're going to sing that very soon. Um, But let's, uh, I I just want to welcome everybody. And some of you didn't get here earlier. So let's say we stand up and uh, shake three hands. Just three. But if you already shook their hand, if you were here earlier and you shook their hand earlier, they they don't count. Three new hands. All right, let's, um, let's come to the Lord and ask for his blessing as we depart from here. And don't forget the lunch. If you didn't know, there's free lunch today. Well, it's not free, is it? It's $5. But anyway, you should have paid already. All right, so if you miss out now, you've already, you're throwing away money. Um, let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for 34 years Uh, as a church, and we thank you that we get to have these reminders uh, of your faithfulness to us over time. Lord, we pray that um, as we depart from here, that your Holy Spirit indwell us in such a way that we should never lose faith in you, that we should trust in you in everywhere we go and in every person we meet. Lord, use us to bring your spirit, your grace, your mercy, your gospel to those around us. We pray in Jesus' name. We'll see you in the welcome room.